Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is um, our podcast on the endocrine system. Um, I want you to take this, the nervous system, and the immune system and place them all under the same umbrella, and that's the umbrella of cellular communication. Okay. Um, all of these systems, uh, while they're certainly not the only systems, all cells in the body communicate with other cells, but these are systems where those, those communications are uh, particularly fundamental to talking about how they work. Um, uh, neurons in the nervous system communicate with each other through electricity and those little neurotransmitters at the synapse. Uh, immune cells are uh, communicating uh, to determine whether a cell is self or non-self, uh, and then communicating with other cells about killing foreign cells. And in the endocrine system, we have uh, tissues in one region of the body that are secreting chemicals to communicate with a tissue in a very, perhaps, distant place in the body. Okay, So communication and endocrine system would, is falling under that umbrella. Okay. Um, The uh, introductory slide here does show the glands. The endocrine system is a system of glands that produce hormones, uh, chemicals that... Uh, sorry, I'm trying to get my pen to work, and I'm not... There it goes. Um, uh, hormones, these chemicals that send signals throughout the body. So. Um, this diagram, I believe, is going to come up again later in the uh, in the podcast. But you know, this is showing all of the glands that make up the endocrine system: the glands in the near the brain, uh, thyroid, thymus, adrenal, pancreas. Remember, the pancreas produced digestive enzymes that entered into the duodenum, the beginning of the small intestine, to help digest food. But the pancreas also is a hormonal organ. It's an endocrine gland. It secretes hormones that do things for the body as well. And then, of course, we've got the reproductive uh, glands, the ovary, the testes, that are going to be secreting hormones um, that control all kinds of things, maturation, reproductive cycles, and so on. So um, uh, that those are the parts of the body we're talking about. Now, uh, like the nervous system, like many things, but in particular the nervous system, uh, the endocrine glands are involved in, in regulation of body activities. Um, we need hormones. Uh, they help coordinate the body, sending messages from one part of the body to another, um, and coordinating in whole body functions, like growth, for example. That's something that, can tr that happens all over the body, and so hormones are used to control that and coordinate it. Um, homeostasis, that's a really important thing. In fact, I should write that word up here. Homeostasis. All body systems, all of them, are exist to help an organism excuse me, maintain homeostasis, okay? That is from the beginning of the year. We talked about the importance of homeostasis in, in terms of body temperature maintenance and pH maintenance and things like that. But there are so many ways that we need to keep things level in the body, okay? Um, so the, the crowning system for maintaining homeostasis is this endocrine system. Uh, many of the uh, hormonal cycles are geared toward monitoring body levels for certain characteristics and if something gets too high we bring it down if something gets too low we bring it up and homeostasis is is at the center of of this uh, organ system so let's please remember that um, the endocrine system monitors solute levels in the blood like glucose um, for example if you've got too much glucose in your blood you need to bring it down if you have too little you need to bring it up uh, ion levels like calcium salts and things like that your metabolic rate uh, how quickly your overall chemical reactions are going in your body uh, growth development uh, the 
maturation process, when that happens, how that happens, uh, reproduction, reproductive cycles, and so on. A lot of really, really important things for, for living organisms are monitored, controlled, coordinated by the um, hormonal uh, endocrine system. Okay, so regulation of the body is achieved mainly by two organ systems. The endocrine, which we are currently studying, the nervous system, which we have already studied. Um, they both regulate stuff. Your brain is regulating things and how your body responds to things, but so is your endocrine system, and they do it in two fundamentally different ways. The endocrine system is a system of glands, these organs made up of tissues that secrete chemicals, okay, into the blood. Um, that's what they do. And again, we see all these glands that we saw in that first picture and, and uh, this picture, okay. The chemicals that are secreted by these glands travel through the body and and travel hopefully to some target tissue where they will have an effect and that may be a tissue rather far away from where they're created. Um, please note right here this one it is absolutely essential that the target tissue where these hormones might be traveling to has receptors that will receive those hormones. If there are no receptors on the target tissue then you can secrete hormone all day long, but those target tissues won't be able to receive it without receptors. This is a, a, a cause for many genetic disorders, is a, a, a lacking of receptors on target cells. So um, it's really a, an important point. The response that the endocrine system gives is a slow, long-lasting response. Um, that is going to be uh, more moderated over time, where right, whereas the um, nervous system, a system of neurons, uh, not glands, uh, is going to be transmitting electrically, uh, though using chemicals too in the form of those neurotransmitters, um, and, but the response is going to be quite different. It's going to be very, very fast. As you might recall milliseconds, uh, and it does not last terribly long, um, whereas an endocrine system response can be quite permanent in the terms of growth, for example, um, maturation, things like that. This is a nice little diagram that is showing a comparison of the nervous system as a regulator versus the endocrine system as a regulator, um, showing how axons do uh, secrete chemicals, those neurotransmitters, and they go to target, target cells and have an effect, but an endocrine, the endocrine system message secreted by this endocrine gland up here is dropped directly into the bloodstream uh, and flows in the blood to its target tissue to have some other kind of effect. Okay? Um, okay. And um, important to note, they both do require receptors. I want, uh, want you to make sure you get that commonality as well. Receptors are required for both. Okay. Um, now, talking about hormones, uh, there are um, many hormones, but they belong in two main classes. Um, those that are made mostly from protein and those that are made mostly from lipid, okay? Very important. Um, when we are talking about protein-based hormones, there are some that are made out of polypeptides. As you might remember, a polypeptide is a string of amino acids, okay? Um, small proteins, uh, relatively speaking, like insulin, a very famous one. Another one you might not heard, have heard of, it's called ADH. It's anti-diuretic hormone. We'll maybe talk a little bit about that later. Um, glycoproteins, which you should know. We've mostly talked about glycoproteins in terms of cell identification markers. A protein 
stuck in a membrane with a carbohydrate sticking off the top. Well, glycoproteins can do other things as well, and they can act as protein-based hormones. Um, uh, so a big old protein glob with a carb sticking off of it. FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone, and LH, luteinizing hormone, which are both reproductive hormones normally associated with women, but men make them too. Um, Amines, uh, meaning these are modified amino acids, okay. Uh, epinephrine, uh, which is the fight or flight. Uh, we might also think of this as adrenaline. They are the same. Uh, and melatonin is another famous uh, amino acid hormone. Okay, the lipid hormones, when you think of a lipid-based hormone, the first thought that should come to your mind is steroids, that branch of lipids we talked about earlier in the year, and I want you to think of this picture. This is a molecule of cholesterol. Modified cholesterol is what lipid-based hormones are generally made of. Cholesterol, remember, has these four carbon rings. Uh, we talked about how you need to recognize that shape as being cholesterol. And then the rings may have various functional groups hanging off of them, and that's going to determine what they become. If we leave it alone, it's just cholesterol. If we hang different things off of these, uh, where these little functional groups are, then we are going to turn it into a sex hormone of one type or another, testosterone, estrogen, whatever. Okay? Now, these two classes of hormones act on their target cells, the cells that will be receiving them, in fundamentally different ways. Lipid-based hormones are going to go inside of the cell and have an effect. Protein-based hormones cannot go inside of the cell. They have to be received by a receptor on the outside, and then they will cause that receptor to do something. So let's talk about this. Um, because lipid-based hormones, if you'll remember, we, when we were talking about cell membranes, lipids can pretty easily travel through a cell membrane with their concentration gradient because um, they aren't polar, and so they can kind of slide on through. Um, therefore, they can diffuse across the membrane without having any kind of particular special doorway or channel or whatever, and that is what they do. Uh, they will then bind to certain receptors made out of protein, receptor proteins, inside the cytoplasm and even inside the nucleus. They can go all the way into the nucleus. Um, and in fact, they do and will bind to DNA molecules and cause the DNA itself itself to do certain things. We are going to talk about transcription factors later in the year when we talk about um, how genes work, but um, let's suffice it to say that if uh, perhaps one of these hormones binds to the DNA, it can encourage that particular gene to become active or to become inactive, as the case may be. Okay, so turning on genes, for example. All right. Protein-based hormones are different. They are hydrophilic. They, they are not going to be able to diffuse across the membrane. They must bind to a receptor on the membrane surface. So if here is a cell, we've got to have a receptor available for protein-based hormones. Now, what these hormones then will do is the receptor will know they are there. The receptor has a part of itself that is inside the cell, and then that will trigger a secondary reaction where things will begin to happen inside the cell. And it's often it's a lot of things. It's a whole lot of chemical reactions. Okay? So an internal cellular response will be caused just because this hormone bound to this receptor on the outside. Okay? So in the case of lipid hormones, so this is case one, those lipid-based hormones that can go inside of cells, okay? Um, let's say the hormone is secreted into the bloodstream, so here it is, that's the, the hormone right there. Um, it might be carried through the blood by some little protein carrier, whatever. Okay, uh, this over here, this is a cell membrane, and this is cytoplasm, 
Okay, this is the target cell over here. So this thing is trying to get to its target. Okay, um, and that's the nucleus. This uh, kind of blue-green barrier represents the nuclear membrane. Okay, so what we have here at number one is this steroid hormone squirting through between the phospholipids and going inside because it can. Okay, uh, at number two we have a receptor protein that waits inside the cytoplasm and is designed to pick up this particular hormone. Okay, At number three, we can see the DNA in the nucleus, and this hormone with its receptor actually becomes a, a complex, a, a structure, a transcription factor that is going to allow this particular gene, maybe there's a gene here in the DNA, and it's going to activate it and cause it to become transcribed. We'll talk about that meaning later. It's just, it's activated. At that point, mRNA, you might remember, that is just the copy of the gene that's actually going to go out into the cytoplasm and, 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 and do the work um, that we need it to do. That gene, that mRNA, will be translated, read by a ribosome, and make the protein that apparently the cell needs. So basically, this hormone led to the creation of some protein needed by the cell. Okay, It did that by going into the cell and manipulating the DNA itself. Okay, okay. Um, a good example uh, of an end product of such an a, a event would be secretion of proteins, for example, growth factor uh, uh, that would cause your body to grow and grow hair, whatever. Okay? All right. Um, now, protein hormones are different, and that's where we're going to spend most of our discussion. Okay? This represents your target cell. Okay? All of that. That's the cell membrane of the target cell, the cytoplasm. And this is the receptor. This purple thing here is the receptor that is going to receive this protein hormone. Okay? Now, that is called the signal. Okay, um, it binds to the receptor and activates that receptor, which in turn activates a little protein in just inside the cytoplasm called a G protein. Okay, that G protein takes up a GTP molecule, which causes it to become energy become energetic. GTP is a slightly less energetic form of something like ATP. It doesn't have quite as much energy, but it can do some things. So this G protein gets activated and binds some GTP, so it's got a little energy. That complex of the G protein and that energy molecule then activates another uh, enzyme here, which then activates Uh -huh. um, which then causes ATP molecules to get converted from ATP to something called cyclic AMP or CAMP. Okay? Really, what you need to be getting here is this idea of this chain reaction that is all caused because that hormone bound to this receptor. Okay? So, Let's go back again so we don't get lost. Hormone binds to receptor. Receptor is modified, activates the G protein. G protein binds the energy molecule GTP, which causes it to bind to this protein here, the lighter purple, which then begins converting ATP molecules, lots of them, to cyclic AMP molecules. And that's important because these are called second mes secondary messengers, okay? These are going to carry out a message that we need to activate other proteins in the cell. It will activate one enzyme, which activates another enzyme, which then uh, is going to cause something to happen. This 
idea here of going from this primary signal to this secondary signal is called transduction. We are carrying the message through this chain reaction. Okay, it's also called a secondary messenger system. This being the secondary messenger, this being the system. Okay, and we're going to get some action that we need. That's the response. Okay, that's the basic formula for protein hormones and how they work. Okay, um, we're going to look at that next in a particular instance uh, example. This is the term you need to take away from this slide among the, the main ideas. Signal transduction pathway. It is a pathway of chemical reactions. One thing leads to something else, something else, something else, and you get this cascade of events. Signal transduction pathway. All right. Now, this really works with certain specific protein hormones. Let's look at epinephrine, what you might think of as adrenaline, that fight or flight hormone. Okay. Uh, let's say we are in your liver cell. Uh, there's the cytoplasm. There's the cell membrane with a receptor bound in it. Your adrenal gland, which is actually sitting atop your kidney, sees a big bar. That looks like an angry bar. We better run. Okay, so your adrenal gland will secrete adrenaline, or epinephrine is the more accepted term now. Epinephrine, and that um, hormone, that protein based hormone, will lodge on the surface of your liver cells in this receptor. Okay, now. The reason it is going to lodge on the surface of your liver cell is because your livers store glycogen. I don't know if you remember that term. I hope you do. Glycogen is bunches of glucose molecules linked together. It's an energy storage molecule. Well, why might you want to do something with that? Well, you just saw a big, scary bar. Okay, and we are going to run from the bear. You need energy to do that. So your body is going to say, hey, liver, need some energy. Break down some of that glycogen and give me some glucose quick. And so that's what epinephrine is doing. It is going to give you some energy really, really fast. Okay, um, so that's the signal. The epinephrine is the signal. And now that receptor is going to activate this receptor is going to alter its shape here and activate this G protein will actually be over there and will actually get activated. The G protein is always carrying GDP, but when it gets activated, it's going to pick up a GTP molecule, as you can see right there, and that's going to activate it to go over to this guy, this light purple guy, and that is called adenyl cyclase. I'm trying. Let me go back and make sure we've got these steps. So, big scary bar, adrenal gland produces epinephrine. Epinephrine is accepted on a receptor on the surface of your liver cell. The receptor alters its shape, which activates this G protein. The G protein picks up GTP, which gives it some energy, which moves it over here to this uh, protein called adenyl cyclase. What that does is that takes ATP molecules, lots of them, and converts them into C-AMP, cyclic AMP molecules. That's important because those cyclic AMP molecules are the secondary messenger molecules that are going to activate the rest of the reaction. Uh, some protein called protein kinase A gets activated. You don't need to know it. The protein kinase A, these are all enzymes, by the way, as you can tell by the ACE endings, S activates another kinase, uh, activates another enzyme, phosphorylase, uh, whatever. This is the transduction. We're activating, activating, activating enzymes. And eventually, what we're going to get is this enzyme is going to take that glycogen and chop it up into glucose molecules. And that's going to be released to your blood, so you've got energy. Okay, that is a real signal transduction pathway. All right, so the fundamental point of that is not just that we have a lot of complicated steps to go through. 
but the primary point of that is amplification. We are going to make this response from this one itty bitty little molecule right there huge inside the cell. One little molecule is going to send a cascade of events that is going to just produce an enormous amount of glucose. Okay? Um, this single receptor that received that will actually activate many G proteins, not just one, many. Those G proteins will actually activate many of these adenyl cyclase molecules. Those will make many, many, many cyclic AMP molecules amplified, amplified. Each of those cyclic AMP molecules will uh, target uh, protein kinase. Each of those protein kinase molecules will in turn activate many enzymes and each of those enzymes individually will create many products. Um, it is amplification, amplification, amplification all over the place. Um, now notice here each amp only goes to one uh, protein, but then each of these can amp uh, can activate many enzymes. Um, each of these can make many C amps. Each of these can activate uh, make many products. So most of this is a step of amplification, 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 amplification. That's really important. We're getting a huge reaction from a teeny tiny event initially. Okay. A cascade multiplier, huge, huge amplification, and leading to a very, very fast response, given it's not a nervous response. Okay? All right, we're going to stop there, take a break, and then we're going to pick it up by looking at some of these cycles of hormones, some of which we've, uh, this idea of this cycling we've looked at before. Okay? Thanks a lot. See you in the next part. Bye.